not only good morning, but welcome. If you are a guest of ours this morning, we're so honored to have you. And uh, for those of you who are regular VC2 attenders, I would say you are identifying yourself as the type leader you are. So um, this morning is going to be a really special thing um, for mine and Chad's heart um, because training leaders is what makes a difference. I know it's what pumps in Chad's heart. Um, and to be honest, I've learned a lot about it from him um, growing through life together. And this morning you have an opportunity to really grow and make what, call, what I call and have learned as a paradigm shift. Um, if you tend to be a, a person who's quiet, backwards, as I was growing up, hanging out with leaders will change who you are. Um, Chad recently taught us that you are the sum total of the five people you hang out most with, which tells me we should be really purposeful and intentional about the people that we spend our intimate quality time with. God has called us to minister to all and love all, and I can be with anybody. But when it comes to making a mark on my life, I want to be intentional about the people I spend my time with because I am going to gravitate and be more like them. So um, I just want to encourage you to, to open up and let the Holy Spirit speak to you this morning because he, Taylor, makes everything for us. And set your heart to receive. Put your mind, I don't want to say in coast, but determine that it in your heart a good ground. Because one of the things I had to learn as a, a growing leader was I could be quick to justify why not something. And if a leader challenged me on something that required more effort than I wanted to put into something, <laughs> I could come up with a thousand good excuses <laughs> of why not. So I think it's, it's very important from the very get-go, what is it you set in your heart to learn today from Holy Spirit? Because Chad is just simply a vessel he's going to use. And since we only have less than three hours now and counting, I'm going to hush because I think what he's got to say is so important. All right? So let me introduce my husband, Chad Waller, for those of you who may not know him. We have been married 28 years come November. Long time together. And he, with Holy Spirit, has transformed my life. <laughs> Jesus has used him as a catalyst in my, my life. Um, long list of accomplishments. Uh, I could stop and think. He, he's done everything in a church from cleaning, construction, to um, training youth, training youth leaders, training worship team, worship team members, training other churches' worship team members. And he's had the opportunity to speak in more places than I can count. But... Above all, I can say my honor is that he's my best friend. Mm -hmm. Besides Amen. Jesus, he is my best friend and the person I have enjoyed hanging out with more than any other. So come Amen. on and start, Amen. babes. Thank you. So good morning to you. When we were planning this, the staff said, no, you can't just jump up there and start teaching. We have to do a proper introduction. I was like... And they asked me. <laughs> I despise introductions um, because, uh, I, well, it's just Jesus is a guest of honor. Amen. Yes. So today what I'm going to talk about is transformational leadership. I'm going to spend uh, the next three hours. We will take breaks. and I'll give you a, a break from hearing my voice. And uh, Pastor Melinda will share some of what she's learned being married to a transformational leader. Uh, this term is not necessarily new, though it's not heard a lot in the church. Obviously, the, the thought of transformation is a, 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 a much taught or, or biblical aspect of, of what the Christian life should be. But you probably have not heard a lot the term transformational put with leadership. There are probably over a thousand studies in the business world on what transformational leadership is. It has been studied more so from a business standpoint and what, what the uh, markets or business need in, in a transformational leader more so than in church. 
But I, I think that you'll see by the end of the day that uh, transformational leadership is what we are called to. And, and that one of the, the reasons churches have not been successful is they have missed this factor of transformation. Um, after all, isn't salvation all about transformation? Yeah. Isn't that what it's all about, being transformed? And we will look at scriptures that will help us understand that today. Before I get started, will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, uh, I was never promised to be the teacher or the guide or the leader into all truth. You were. And I know to lead and guide uh, this crowd, this, this, the people gathered here today into all truth would be impossible for a man to do. But not impossible for you to do. You know where every single person is at. You know where they're at in their level of leadership skill. You know where they're at in their growth uh, with you. So come into this room in a supernatural, mighty way. I love you. I honor you. I worship you. Thank you for leading and guiding us. Thank you for not leaving us orphans, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for sending your spirit until the work on earth is done. I just ask that you flood this room, flood our hearts. We're not jumping up. We're not shouting. We're not screaming right now. But we're desperately in need of you to do what you've called us to do in central Georgia, throughout central Georgia, to do what you've called us to do in the nations. We, we need you. We need your help. So come today and teach us. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. amen. When you've been uh, around the church world as, as long as some of us have, I've been since 1984 when I walked into a church and said, I think I'm called to ministry. Within two years was in full-time ministry. I had very little training. Honestly, I was just kind of thrown in the deep end and told to swim. Um, you've seen many styles of leadership. I, I know that um, all of us have been under different pastors or leaders. And uh, you, even in the workplace, you've seen different styles of leadership. You've seen the leaders who reward people who do well and scold those who don't. You've seen leaders who use people for what they can get out of them. And when you're no longer useful to them... They are done with you, both in the church and in the business world. I often tell people, I know what it's like to feel like you're used just for your gifts. Because I've been in that place. That place where a leader likes you for what you can do, but they don't want to know anything about what you do when you're not at church. Like it doesn't even matter to them if you're getting drunk or high. Come on. Because they just don't want to know that part. Because that's messy life. You see, true life on life, discipleship like we speak of around here a lot at VC2. True um, life on life, mentoring. It's messy. Because it's not always easy. It's not always clean. It's not always fun. It's not always pleasant. It's, all, it's most, most always inconvenient. I have found Christians have breakdowns at the most inconvenient times for me. Right? If you, haven't, if you haven't discovered that, you haven't been around the block that many times. Because um, it, it, it's where the it's not about me becomes real. It's the, 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 the party you've been waiting on for months. And that day somebody has an emergency. It's the heart attack in the middle of the night. It's the, you know, those, those situations. And there's not a thing you can do about it. It's ministry is inconvenient. When you're using people just for production and what you can get out of them, you don't really care what happens to them. How many times has someone said to you, I quit going to church and no one ever even checked on me? Yeah. How many times have you heard that? Yep. I mean, I can be honest, I've heard that here. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You know, right or wrong, it's just the facts. There are styles of leadership that um, are just mean. They're just mean. They're like, you know... Uh, Pharaohs, less straw, more bricks kind of leadership. And they just don't, they don't give a hoot about you. They're just like, make me bricks. And there's no communication. Nobody likes them. They don't like anybody and nobody likes them. And as long as the product gets done. And there may be some general, hey, I, I appreciate y'all because they went to some John Maxwell thing and they know they're supposed to say that. But 
but you know when they say, hey, I appreciate you. Hey, you know, I care about y'all. Yeah, no, I don't know it. I don't even feel it. But with transformational leadership, it is completely different. So today, there are three areas, and I'm just talking us through this. I'm, I probably, I'll see how long I can sit. I probably won't get up and scream and preach too much. I just want to talk us through this. So if this is a little different me than you're used to, you can stay awake. And really, you get, you'll get out of this whatever you want. You'll get out of today whatever you want. I'm going to talk about what does it mean to be a transformational leader, how we can learn to be transformational leaders, and how we can train others to be transformational leaders. So first, what is transformational leadership? The answer I'm going to give you, my definition, is one I have made up myself. I don't think made up is right, but as I grow up, y'all, I'll learn the right words to say. The one I've constructed out of my years of experience um, the funny thing is y'all should hear me teaching to Harvard students. That's just, that's hilarious. If God hasn't got a sense of humor. This transformational leadership, when you look for definitions, you can find business definitions if you just Google it. You can find all kinds of things from the business world. But I don't know if you've ever read business world definitions. They make no sense to me. They make just none. And I, I don't think that makes sense to anybody. But they're just big words, a lot of big words to try to describe something that nobody's quite sure how we're going to make it happen. So for me, this, the, the simple definition is it is a style of leadership that seeks not only to get people to follow, but to grasp the vision and mission, to be changed for the better, and to help extend the mission, vision and mission. So you seek to, to get people to follow. Now that alone scares people. When you start talking about trying to get people to follow you. Or rather they shouldn't be following you, they should be following Jesus. Well, who are you following? The church really has to stop this, this self-imposed humility that is not true humility and true meekness. True humility understands where its strength comes from. It doesn't deny it has strength. I said true humility doesn't deny it has strength. It just knows where that strength comes from. And you've got to stop being afraid to say, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. This is what we're called to. So this style of leadership that seeks not only to get people to follow, but to grasp the vision and mission, the reason I want you to follow me. And then not just to follow me, but to be changed for the better, and then to learn to do the same. In simple terms, Jesus walked up to some guys and said, hey, follow me. And I will change your life. I'm going to change your occupation. I'm going to teach you how to be fishers of men. So he said, follow me. There's going to be a transformation and I'm going to teach you how to do it. And then you will be agents of that same transformation. That in essence is the gospel Hey, dude, your life is a mess. Follow me. I'll take you to the place and show you how it cannot be a mess. And in turn, you can show others how not to be a mess. You see, the fact is, um, Pastor Melinda said it very clearly. You must today not, don't, don't waste time telling God why you can't be a transformational leader. As I read the things and talk to you about what a transformational leader is, you must not waste any time today saying why you can't be a transformational leader. Listen to me. The enemy, well, let me back. God has a plan for your life. Amen. Can everybody say amen to that? God has a plan for your life. And his plan is for you to be transformed and you to help others be transformed, right? And just as God has a plan for your life, the enemy has a plan for your destruction. And so the enemy laid seeds of his plan to destroy us, even as we were children. The abuse, the abuse was not about, let's just destroy him. The abuse was about, let's destroy the one who has a call for, to be a transformational leader 
to be an agent of change in the earth to extend the kingdom of God. So let's destroy him and let's plant seeds of doubt in him. Let's plant seeds of fear in her. Let's destroy her self-confidence. Let's destroy him. And so what the enemy sought to do was to plant seeds so a crop of failure would come up at this appointed time so that you would say, I can't do that. I, I, I make it a habit. I love studying transformational leaders through history. I'll read some of them to you today. Some of them I'll, I'll tell you about. Some of the ones I won't tell you about because you would not, ha- the church probably couldn't handle talking about these people as transformational leaders. But most of the men um, who, and they were men, women, you can thank God for that, who have tried to destroy the earth with their amazing transformational gifts. You see, Hitler was a transformational leader. He sought to bring transformation in the earth. And many of the, 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 the men who sought to take over the earth to bring transformation for their vision that they had of what the world should look like. They still had transformational gifts, but in them were planted seeds of hatred so that those gifts were perverted. Listen, I know that all of you probably have served either a leader in the business world or in the church that brought harm and pain to you. That leader, I can almost assure you, at no point ever sat down and said, how can I work to bring harm and pain to people? What can I do to destroy lives? That was not their goal, but it was the enemy's goal. The enemy's goal, can I cripple you in such a way so as that you will be an ineffective or even worse, an abusive leader? I, when I sit down with my, my leadership team, a, a group that I started training when we were launching here at VC2, four years ago, I sat and had a, a meeting with a group of young leaders and saying, I believe God's called you to help me lead this, this ministry. And just would pour to them every Wednesday night. And when I sat down to talk with them, one of the questions I posed to them was simply this, finish this sentence. If the enemy stopped me, it would be blank. If the enemy were able to stop me, he would use blank. You say, well, I don't, I don't like thinking about that. You better think about that because your enemy is. There's a thing in band we used to call know your tendencies. If you have the tendency to play flat, then tune sharp. If you have the tendency to play sharp, then tune flat. Know your tendencies. You have the tendency to play too much, hold back. Tendency to play too loud, hold back. You, you have to know your tendency. You have the tendency to be depressed. When somebody says to you, you seem depressed, you shouldn't go, no, not me. You should go, probably am. That's my tendency. Yep. Yep. And then learning to pray into those tendencies to say, I refuse to be that way. Right. You see, what the enemy meant to harm me, come on somebody, yeah. will be the very thing that God will take and yeah. use yep. to bless others. I've heard, I've heard people say, sometimes the enemy gives you a lot of clues toward your future if you'll just listen. He give you clues. You nobody, nothing going nowhere. Oh, I'm somebody going, I'm somebody doing something. I'm going somewhere. Oh, okay, thank you. Yep. <laughs> what does it mean to be transformed? The, the word transform in the, the uh, dictionary online just says, To transform is to change something completely and usually in a good way. Usually in a good way. And it's clear that we we should understand that I I can be a catalyst for transformation in a good way or a bad way. Tornadoes transform, right? But not in a good way. Right? There have been leaders who came into the earth and they transformed the culture, the nation, but not in a good way. There have been other leaders who transformed for better. So, um, you... I believe that you cannot truly be a transformational leader until you've been transformed. Um, Let me hit pause, and I'm sorry for this. I know it's being recorded, but I meant to make sure that everybody knew this, and we didn't. It was supposed to be announced at the beginning, and I forgot to tell you. All of my notes are on version, and you probably saw the thing up there. But let me explain to you what version is for those of you who don't know. It is a way that you can digitally follow every one of my notes so you don't have to try to take them and write them all out unless you like writing them out, okay? 
I apologize. I was supposed to make sure that was announced to you from the beginning, and I, I, that's my, my failure. Transitional, transformational leaders can handle admitting their failure, okay? And I should have told you because I see some of you writing really hard. If you have a, a personal flotation device, um, I don't know why I keep t- using that joke because nobody ever gets it nor finds it funny. But as any good preacher, I'm going to keep using that joke till somebody laughs at me or gets it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the two that laughed. There'll be a reward. I'll be a, tr- I'll be a transitional leader for a minute and give you two a reward for that. The rest of you, bad. No. Um, if you have some kind of device, a smartphone, if you have an a, a iPad, anything, you can just go online and you can watch these at version. Every one of these notes, pretty much, except for the extemporaneous ramblings that I share, these notes are on there, and you can follow those. You can actually email a copy to yourself, and they'll be up uh, literally live so that you can go to this anytime. If you get home today, you can go to this and download these notes so you don't wear yourself out trying to write. Now, if you're one of those people that likes to write because it helps you remember, I like doing that. It helps me stay focused. That's fine, but they're all there. You cannot be a transformational leader until you've been transformed. This is a point in the body of Christ that I don't get. You. I, don't, I, I just don't understand how you think you can lead somebody where you've never been. Yeah. Watching people try to lead worship who don't even know how to worship is one of the silliest things in the world to me. <laughs> like, you fixing to take me where? If you tell me you've never built a house, I am not hiring you to build my house. Yeah. I, I've watched many people do it. I don't care how many people you've watched. And so, honestly, until you've been transformed, you might even can explain to me how you've seen other lives transformed, but you don't understand it. Mm-hmm. In fact, one of the things that the world is tired of is people who teach the word without passion. And the reason they have no passion is because they've never experienced it. Taste and see that the Lord is good, blessed as a man, trust in him. If the man has never trusted in him, but he's only been trained to repeat things, if the man is never, or woman is never tasted, then you don't know. Yep. It looks like it tastes good. It sounds like it tastes good. But passion comes from being the one who has him, he or he, th- th- has tasted. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't truly be a transformational leader until you're transformed. You, you might find yourself right here today and say, this is where I'm stuck and this is where my problem is because I don't think I've been transformed. And here's what I challenge you as you hear the things I'm going to share today. I challenge you, start today. Make a choice to allow God to transform your thoughts, your speech, your life, your actions, everything. You find a place today when I say about transformational leaders, you're like, I'm not there. Then circle that one and say, God, this is where I feel like by your Holy Spirit, we need to start I want to be transformed here amen Amen. don't give up don't say today well that just sounds too hard and that was all that was kind of complicated I don't think it's complicated at all I think you'll find it incredibly simple we must be transformed by the power of God a transformational leader has been changed by God and it produces in them a desire to see other people transformed you've been transformed by God when you've encountered God and you see somebody else that's bound, it is just part of your nature to say, oh, I know how you can get free. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. What's your problem? I know, I know how you can be free from that. It is, uh, when we try to teach people, you need to witness, you need to witness, you need to witness. I feel like we're trying to take people who haven't experienced the transformed power of God and make them do something they're not even sure about. Yeah. Uh-huh. Listen, if Jesus has really changed you, you can't hide it. You can't not tell. You'll be like, oh, Holy Spirit, am I supposed to say something? Oh, Holy Spirit, oh, oh, Holy Spirit, oh, oh, she says, oh, I can't do it. Look, I got to stop you. I know what your problem is, and I know who can help. Amen. It's not a, should I? I wonder if I should say anything. I don't want to offend her. You're like, no. When you've truly been touched by the transformational power of God, it affects everything about you. That's why I think it is so important. This kind of leader is not a leader by career, but by calling. It's not by career, but it's by calling. They may have never been to seminary. They may never plan to go to seminary. 
Am I, am I, I know I'm, thank you, dearest. Thank you for untangling me. They may have no plans to get a, a theological degree. They may never be in full-time ministry. Transformational leaders. God needs in every avenue of society. We have to weigh, we have to get away from the thought that, a, that, that all leaders that God will raise up will be in full-time ministry. By that I mean paid. We all are in full-time ministry. Some of us just get paid to do it. Do you understand that? Every one of us are called to the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God is making his appeal through us to the world. And he ain't mad. (laughs) And that he's at peace. And that everyone can enter into that peace. That he has paid for our sins. Let me tell you something. We need transformational leaders in our our army, our navy, our air force, our marines. We need people in business. We need people in the workplace. Because the power of transformation needs to be in every sector of our society. So not it's not by career, but by calling. Only transformational leaders can transform their culture. Only transformational leaders are transforming their culture. I have people ask me all the time, what is the success of this church? What has happened? How did this happen? I have pastors secretly meeting with me. You know, I have, and when I say secretly, they're not like on Facebook asking me. But having lunch or meeting privately, they're like, can you just tell me what did y'all do? I have people meeting, asking me, Pastor Chad, can you tell me how that happened? And I used to say, literally used to say, I have no idea. I have no idea. And recently the Lord rebuked me. He rebuked me. He said, you have a lot of idea. I got a call from Pastor Raphael Najim. He went back to his leaders and in, in, in all the, the churches that he leads and says, basically, I've been to the promised land. I see what God is doing. And I'm going to bring this young whippersnapper up here to teach us how he did it. And immediately my response is, I don't know what I did. The Lord rebuked me and said, you absolutely do know the journey we've been on. Stop and take a look. And I'd been telling Melinda, it was amazing. That got on this calendar and I was like, what am I going to do there? And this was already on the schedule and I was already studying for this day. And as I sat just studying through all the stuff in my life as a transformational leader and where I've been, I realized that transformational leadership is what has changed this church not just from me but from all the transformational leaders that have come together from the people that I said follow from the people who looked at me one day and said I'm afraid to follow you because I'm afraid of what happened with me (laughs) from the people who said to me when they came here I'm here at this church but don't expect me to do anything and now are just as much a part of the mission and the vision as, as anybody else. Amen. From the people who have a heart, from the people who are friends of this ministry, don't even attend here all the time, but you know God's doing something and you drink from here. There, when I sat down to go through it, I realized that this transformational under, the understanding of transformational power of God in our lives, through our lives, that gives us vision and mission far beyond just building a church, but transforming a culture is what God has been working into the fabric of my life and Pastor Melinda's life for the last 28 years. If we want to make a difference, we must set our hearts not just to confront the culture, but to see the culture transformed. We can't just confront things. That's why I love, I'm, I'm repping for ABC Women's Clinic here today with this beautiful mug. I didn't plan to use it for an example, but it is an example. That's why I love the women's clinic, because we're not just saying end abortion, we're saying there's an alternative. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. That's the reason I love um, Mighty Men, because we're not just saying you should get off drugs, we're saying here's a place where you can get off drugs. Uh, breaking free, broken shackle. That's why I love what we're doing in this city. We're not just saying somebody should help this city. We're doing everything within our power to help this city. That's why we support ministries that have the, the, the thought of 
transforming the culture. We're not just saying you folks should change. We're saying follow us. We have found transformation power in Jesus and he will transform your life too. Amen. You don't have the right just to confront. I think the, the church has missed it when we think boycotting and just saying no, no, no. Okay, fine. Say no to this. But what is it I'm to say yes to that will change my desire to do that into a desire to do something else? That's transformation. I don't think we should just confront. God doesn't just confront. He offers grace to transform. Amen. God doesn't just confront you. Uh, John said we beheld him full of grace and truth. Not only does he give you truth that's wrong, but he gives you grace to change what's wrong. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm glad he didn't just confront me and say, you know, you're wrong. Good luck finding what's right. No, no, no. He confronted me and he said, here is the grace that you need to overcome that wrong. Yep. Amen. And see, that's the grace we need to extend. Transformational leaders are not afraid to extend that grace. But we must go from being trained leaders to being transformational leaders. We must go from being trained to transformational. And trained leaders are like robots. Trained leaders, you will often hear say, what would Pastor Chad want to do here? Because they're looking to please Pastor Chad. They're looking to make the leader happy. Trained leaders don't even get why the leader is the way he is. He just wants this place clean all the time. I don't know why he wants it clean. Ain't nothing wrong with a dirty church. Oh, there is something very wrong with a dirty church. There's something wrong with a dirty house. There's something wrong with it. Come on. Amen. And what it shows is I, A, haven't had time to take care of what God has given me, or B, I just don't care. That's right. Yeah. Went to meddling, didn't I? <laughs> but you see, if it's all about Pastor Chad, I, I, I don't, I'll get, you, better get that, you better get that trash before Pastor Chad sees it. He'll have a fit. He don't like trash laying around here. Really? So this is all about let's make Pastor Chad happy. No, see, a transformational leader understands, man, this should not be. A trained leader is always looking at, what, what do we learn at training? What we learn at training? What we learn at training? What we learn at training? What, you're like a robot. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Who has the rules? Who has the rules? Who has the rules? Who has? <laughs> Trained is all about rules. Transformation is all about heart. Yeah. Yep. That's a good one. Trained is all about rules. Transformation is all about the heart. There's a big difference between trained and transformational. And I believe there's a place we can become to that would actually, that we can come to that actually goes, now, oh, hold your hat, that will go beyond what would Jesus do. I think there's a place beyond what would Jesus do. Now listen to me. I don't go in the store, and I'm still learning her, but I don't go in the store and say, what would my wife want? What would my wife, what would she want? What would she want? Oh, will she want this, these avocados on her salad? Will she want, wait a minute, I'm not sure. Avocados on her salad, I gotta think about this. I don't have to think about it. Does she want avocado? No, she doesn't like avocados. Don't you put, the, you put those on her salad, she's gonna send it back. I don't have to say what would Melinda do. I know what Melinda would do because I have been with her and I know what she'll do. I have her heart. See, I can understand the what would Jesus do thing, you know, and, and you pop your wrist, what would you, I got to remember, what would Jesus do in this situation? I understand as a child, you're, you're potty training, but come on, we grow up and we have the heart of Jesus. And sometimes, I, what would you do in this situation if you have the heart of God? What do I need to do here? Holy Spirit, what? what? 
I believe there's a place. Now, I'm not talking to the regular church. I wouldn't even say the, what would you do, Jesus, to just the regular congregation. I'm talking to leaders. You came here on Saturday morning for cracking out loud because you want to learn about transformational leadership. I'm saying for us, there's a place beyond always being concerned. Am I doing the right thing? And settling into what does your heart tell you? Your heart who has, you've sang a thousand times. Here it is. I surrender it to you. He took you at your word when you said that. And if he has transformed your heart, you have within you the mind of Christ and the heart of God to do the right thing. Not to sit around paralyzed by, I don't know, should I pick up that trash? I don't know, should I help that? I don't know if I should say anything there. Of course you should. Because when we're transformed into his image, we simply know what we would do. And and 1 Corinthians 2.16 you just want to jot a note there after all we have the mind of christ right first corinthians 2 16 we have the mind of christ so the difference between trained and transformational is intentionality and what is intentionality the word intentionality if you look at the word you think it has to do with intentions and it really has very little to do with intentions when you look at the definition of the word, it has little to do with intentions because if you just hear somebody say man we need to be more intentional about what we do You you think, well, I had good intentions. How many times have you said, I had good intentions, I just didn't follow through. But intentionality is not about having good intentions. And we've all heard the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? You haven't heard that? Okay, so this is not about having good intentions or, man, I really, I planned on or I was going to try. It's not about that. It is very little to do with intentions, but it is rather uh, deliberate decisions that you make on purpose. Intentionality are deliberate decisions you made on purpose. It's you tripping and saying, I meant to do that. I, I thought when I get to that little piece of carpet, I'm going to trip on that deliberate decisions that you make on purpose in fact being deliberate or purposeful is really what it means or purposive purposive and it is having or serving or done with a purpose and we've got to learn to be deliberate and do what we do on purpose I, the author is unknown. I don't know who to accredit it to, but this, this quote, the church has been a faithful presence throughout history, but we must become an intentional presence if we want to transform our city, our region, and our world. Listen again. The church has been a faithful presence. There have been churches on every corner for years. First thing that was said to us when we came to plant this church, oh, great, just what Washington County needs, another church. Yeah. And, and you know what I said to them? That's exactly what I said to God. <laughs> That's exactly what I said to him. I've been saying that for the last 10 years to him. That's exactly what, oh great, another church. I had people say to me, aren't there enough churches? Well, I guess he doesn't think so because he won't leave me alone. Down to, he finally came to me and said, I have no other option or plan for you. This is my call for you. Take it or leave it. Well, I guess if you put it that way, I'll take it. I mean, I wish I could tell you. I was like, I had the power of transformation in me. I knew what God had done in me. I know what he wanted to do through me. I just didn't want it to happen here. I was ready to move to France and see the glory of God cover that nation. I had prophetic words from the Lord. I knew it was time. And he said, it is not time. It's not enough to just be faithful. You have to be intentional. You see, it's not enough for this church or your ministry or your business where you're called to just to be faithful. You have to be intentional. Intentional. That means you have to do what you do on purpose. For you as a leader, it's not enough just to be faithful and show up. Well, I show up and I'm faithful every week. But when you learn how to be intentional when you show up, then you go far beyond just showing up. But you become intentional in what you do. You're there willing to serve in any way. You're there willing to do whatever it takes, not just show up. It's not enough that the church just be in the city. You hear me? It's not enough that the church just be in the city. Well, here we are. We opened up our doors. Now y'all all come to us. It doesn't work that way. Have we not learned that? I mean, we all understand it. It doesn't work that way. If so, tomorrow morning, every church will be filled. But every church will not be filled tomorrow. In fact, most will be half empty. Y'all know that. 
as I sit and talk to my brothers around the city, there are only a few churches that I can name to you that are having growth issues. You know, I, I've been told not to call them problems, but growth issues that were just out of business. I know that my friend Robert Wood at Piney Mount, is, they're looking at how they're going to build or add on because they're having growth issues because it's packed. I know there are churches on this end of town, packed. I know that there are churches that are having issues. But the fact is, throughout this county, there will be churches where 10 to 12 very elderly people gather right. yeah. to have church. Right. And they say there's no you know, young people. They tell me there's no kids. They tell me these things. And they, and they say, how did you do this? Well, we did it by not being a faithful presence, not putting up a steeple and say, anybody who can see this, y'all come here. Yeah. But being an intentional presence in the city. And going to do the things that bring transformation to a city. It's not enough that we just be in the city. It's not even enough for me that we're growing. Yeah. See, please understand, just because we're growing doesn't mean we're affecting change in the city. Yeah. You get a good enough show, you can get people to come and watch. Oh, yeah. I understand that. I understand that. Look, when we first launched, you know, we were whoo, for a while. And then Pastor Chad started giving some hard messages about what we're going to do. And it kind of went, yeah, well, maybe, I'm not sure. And, and, then it kinda, and then it kind of leveled off. And now it's starting to do this again. Because not everybody wants to do the work. Some people just want to come to the show. Yeah. It's true. It's true. It's true. We must be a transformational force in the city if we want to see it change. Jesus didn't just show up. He came to transform the world. He came with the power of transformation. And do you know that Jesus provoked change everywhere he went? He provoked change everywhere he went. It, it, we are salt and light. And salt is a season that brings the flavors of God to the earth. Through us, God is bringing his flavors to the earth. And we're not just to coexist as some people would suggest that we just coexist. I've seen those tattoos and bumper stickers with all the religions and it says coexist. But we're not here to coexist. We're here to bring transformation. Salt and light bring transformation. That, that, that's what we're called to be. We have been entrusted with the glory of the Lord to release in the earth. We have the power of transformation living inside of us. Listen to Matthew 5, 3 through 16 says, You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall it, uh, its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city. This is not God saying this to Jesus. This is Jesus saying this to his people, to us. You are the light of the world. A city, if we're the light of the world and we're complaining about darkness, whose fault is it? I know that people don't like it when I talk this way, but I'm just telling you, if, if we're not tasting God's presence in the world, who has the salt shaker? If we're not seeing his light in the darkness, who is the light? Well, Jesus, brother, no. Jesus said, you, he first said he was the light. And then he said to them, you are the light. Because yep. that light is in us. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a light, a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We are called to be salt and light. And both of those things are transforming powers. They have transforming powers. We are called to transformation. It's just who we are. We're not called just to coexist. Well, I would share this with you, but I don't want to confront you. Salt confronts tasteless things and says it can taste better. Light confronts darkness and says this can be different. Light drives out darkness, right? You know, you, you should not wonder when people say, you know, I just can't be friends with you. you you're just too intense. What they're trying to say is you're just too bright. Yeah, you challenge my darkness too much. I've actually had somebody say to me, you know, it, you, you can't stay in that church if you want to hold on to your demons. To which I replied, why would you want to hold on to your demons? If you've been confronted, let it go. Nobody sing the song. (laughs) 
Jesus expected us, his church, to be a transforming force on the earth. Amen. That's what he expected us to be. Yeah. Occupy till I come was not, y'all see if y'all can hang on. That was not write songs about holding on till I come. Nope. That was occupy and establish my kingdom. John Maxwell, who we have heard rumored, has a book coming out about transformational leadership and who has authored probably 72, 75 books at this point. But he better hurry because if he doesn't write his, I'm going to write one. And I know his will sell millions of copies, but if mine sells five, that's all right because this stuff needs to get out there. John Maxwell said this, transformational leaders provide compelling vision of a better future and inspire trust through seemingly unshakable self-confidence and conviction. One of the things Melinda has said to me before is, she says, I forget that you're human too sometimes. I forget that sometimes you get your feelings hurt. I forget sometimes that you get discouraged. I forget. Why? Because I, I'm so passionate about what God's called me to do. It's not like I do this as a part-time thing. In fact, I have to remind myself to recreate. I have to remind myself to do hobbyish type things. It's true. (laughs) If you've ever been in a conversation with me for long, you know I'm like the Amway salesman. I'm going to get you back to the plan. Not, not speaking against Amway, if anybody's into that, sorry, that's your thing. But, but I mean, I've got friends that are into that, man, and they're going to work it in any way. They're going to get you back to one of their products. Man, I got a product for that. Come on, I got a product for that. I got a savior for that situation. Amen? Amen. Let me give you a few transformation leaders. There, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and tell y'all. We, I'm like barely even halfway through the introduction, so there's no way we'll get through everything today. So we'll just get what we can, and the rest will be for later, right? Um, let me give you a few transformational leaders that are my heroes, okay? William Wilberforce, he's my hero in transformational, one of my heroes in transformational leadership. And if you've watched the movie Amazing Grace, you, you would know why. And we see in his life how to become a transformational leader. We see the driving force be- be- behind this type of leadership. If you study William Wilberforce's life, you'll see that the enemy had a plan to destroy him, making him a weak sickling, even from the age of, of, of a child. And, and, to, to cause him to give up and think that he couldn't do it. But William Wilberforce refused to let health even hold him back from doing what he felt called to do. And you see a driving theme throughout his life that he just kept pushing to be who he felt called to be and do what he felt called to do. A quote, my favorite quote by him is, You may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say you did not know. You may choose to look the other way. You may never again say you did not know. Abraham Lincoln was a transformational leader. He um, uh, was, uh, again, another one of my heroes. This man transformed a nation. He, He transformed a nation that was completely divided by a war that sought to annihilate our freedoms as a country. You see, even from the birth of this nation that had greatness to be a missionary nation to the nations, that that God was creating a light, uh, uh, like uh, Ronald Reagan said, uh, this, this nation is a city set on a hill. That is what God created us to be. Don't listen to the propaganda that our forefathers didn't know what they were doing. It is straight baloney. You go back and read the text for yourself and listen to the speeches and hear what they said. Read. Were they all righteous? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but you can hear the driving force of transformation that produced what this nation was and what we became and who we are called. And that vision and mission that God has for us is still there. Abraham Lincoln was a force for this transformation and, and he would not relent until slavery was wiped out. He said, uh, two quotes, my favorite by him. He said, I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. <laughs> That's the attitude of a transformational leader. I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. I could preach right there for for an hour. Because I'm going to tell you. Let me just give you one nugget that I share with people. You excuse the faults of your friends and hold the faults of your enemy. 
An enemy can do something to you and you're ready to kill them. A friend can do that same thing and you're like, that's just my friend. You know, they just like that, you know. Come on. I'm afraid the church has become love covers what we want it to cover. My second one was, he has a right to criticize who has a heart to help. He has a right to criticize who has a heart to help. Jesus was a transformational leader, obviously. He challenged the religious thoughts and leaders of the day. Um, boy, do I understand that. <laughs> do I understand that? Jesus said, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For you, even sinners, I should say even, even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Yeah. It was a whole new thought. You know, they thought they were doing good because they love, the, but we're called to love even our enemies. Yeah. Do you understand that we love even the, the foulest Muslim terrorist? If you hate them, you've missed the entire... I don't, I don't like what they're doing. But my heart breaks because they have been taken captive to do the enemy's will. And they will spend eternity in hell. Not in a heaven that they think they're going to when they die for Allah. And Allah is not my God. They are not the same people. Yes, I said it on camera. Your head will be next. Fine. Jesus could see things that no one else could see. He knew things that no one else knew. How? Because he knew his father. The Holy Spirit led him and guided him. The Holy Spirit taught him. The Holy Spirit taught him about what he was called to do and led him into what he was called to do. Just the way he wants to do us. We have the same Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm going to send you a comforter. He will be your teacher. He will lead you and guide you into all truth. Amen. So we have the same, same Holy Spirit. So you have no excuse for, well, I've got this struggle. I've got that struggle. or I've been weakened here. Or the, well, the enemy did this, did that. doesn't matter. You have the Holy Spirit to help you overcome all that. Let me give you five things that transformational leaders do. I'm going to give you five things that they do. We'll take a break. A, a, a much needed potty break and then we will come back okay five things that transformational leaders do one they see things that no one else sees they see things that no one else sees number two they say things that most other people do not say number three they feel things that others don't feel Number four, they believe things that others don't believe. And number five, they do things that others do not do. Five things. They see things that no one else sees. They say things that most other people do not say. They feel things that others don't feel. And they believe things that others don't believe. And lastly, they do things that others do not do.